All right, so um, welcome to the third uh, of the season four of the Thinking Out Loud series. Uh, this is a presidential series uh, uh, sponsored by Chris Paxson's office. And uh, usually, uh, how many, first off, how many folks have been here before to a Thinking Out Loud before? So yes, raise your hand, Kyle, we know. Right, so Kyle and everybody else. All right, so for th those folks and the other folks will understand, uh, I actually, uh, Kevin, so uh, Chris uh, had to uh, run to New York. Uh, Chris Paxson had to run to New York today. Uh, uh, Rick is out on the um, on the trail, um, you know, bowling for dollars and influence uh, as he should be. And uh, Kevin, who is on the program, was also called away. So I'm serving two roles tonight. I'm doing the big thunderous institutional introduction, okay, and to distinguish the two. So when I hold this, you know, I'm doing the thunderous in <laughs> institutional <laughs> introduction. And um, you know, when I go back to me, I'll pull out the alma mater. Uh, introduction, okay? All right, so beaver down. All right, so again, welcome to uh, Thinking Out Loud. And uh, for those of you that haven't been here before, this series is about big questions. Um, we could invite all sorts of people that do interesting work, but the, no the notion here is to invite folks that are talking about something that is both fundamental, interesting, this is a STEM series, so there's some science associated with it, but also that touches on humanity. And uh, Fox Harrell, who's a professor of, uh, excuse me, media, uh, digital media, and wait, artificial intelligence, okay, so at, uh, at MIT, will be telling, will be talking about something that is fundamental, being able to essentially crawl into somebody else's skin with the aids of computers. And he'll, you know, he will say it much better. Uh, and more eloquently than I possibly can. Um, but that's, that's the level of things. And if you look at all the sp previous speakers, they were all dealing with fundamental sorts of questions. So um, Fox got his, uh, he was a Carnegie Mellon type uh, as an undergraduate. So those of you, how many CS people that are roughly CS in here? All right, so Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, you know, has a very powerful uh, computer science program, robotics program as well. but. They're kind of split between the arts and the sciences in a very interesting sort of way that's different than anywhere else. So this was kind of the perfect crucible for somebody like Fox, you know, just out from the outside looking in. Uh, he did his PhD in San Diego in, you know, computer science, of course, and cognitive uh, science. So, you know, think about that as well. So, and then he, I, I don't know, I don't know whether you did any postdocs or anything like that, but, you know, then he did, he, traversed the faculty realm, and now he's a full professor at MIT doing interesting and wonderful things. So we're very pleased. Uh, the institution is very pleased to have you here. <laughs> okay. All right, so now for me. All right, so he is at MIT. This is a beaver, yes. This is, uh, and this is my beaver, too. I mean, it's his beaver. It's also my beaver, you know, alma mater. Uh, and I'll hold it with, with reverence and joy. Um, the thing about this series as well is then again, we could have people that are really smart, have a very basic uh, look at the basic understanding of nature and all that sort of things. But I, I run the series, so I'm looking for people that are slightly out of their minds, uh, plainly and simply. I really am, but in the best possible sort of way. And I try to bring these folks to Brown because Brown is, this, is a weird place. I'm relatively new to Brown, but Brown is the most institutionally flat place that I've been at outside of Bell Laboratories, where I cut my teeth uh, technically, where you have biologists, so Wayne's up there. You know, Wayne and I have been you know, trying to get together and figure out how to do communication theory as applied to biology. Um, people talk across boundaries. That's very, very rare. So we try to bring people that merge a bunch of different areas in interesting sorts of ways. So, you know, before I out, you know, weigh out my welcome, you know, what is it, uh, wear out my welcome, uh, let me bring Fox up here to uh, tell you about uh, avatars and the avatar dream, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. He's brilliant, and he's also a little crazy. So, Fox. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, Chris, for the gracious introduction, and both in your capacity as the bear and as the beaver. <laughs> so, uh, Kat, and also thanks to all the hosts and the people I met over the course of today. It's been a quite stimulating experience meeting with people in a range of disciplines, a range of engagements with different research issues that, that I touch upon. 
And uh, yeah, if there is any sense uh, like in, in the gracious introduction, again, of being out of my mind, maybe one sense you could say that is less in terms of the uh, research, which I hope to convince you is something important and salient for our times, but in the, in the sense of navigating kind of institutional barriers, you know, that is thinking about problems of our time from interdisciplinary perspectives. And so there's a kind of institutional momentum that sometimes you have to navigate in doing this kind of uh, work. But I think it's quite a worthy effort when you can situate fundamental questions ahead and leverage the kind of uh, rigor from various disciplines in order to tackle those kind of questions. And so what I'll speak to you about today is reflections on the avatar dream. Yeah, so what do I mean by this? Yeah, so first of all, there are a lot of kind of dreams of future technologies. But, you know, so you have dreams that looked like uh, this in the middle of last century. You could call something like this the ubiquitous computing dream. Right? That's the dream of smart everything. A kind of technological aspiration that researchers in this area have, as well as general society has this uh, kind of imagination that one day we might achieve, achieve something like this. Another one of these kind of dreams is called the artificial intelligence dream, right? This is the kind of dream of sentient machines, to, uh, to put it in, in one way. And what I contend is that along with dreams like these ones that I've illustrated so far, there's another one which is called the avatar dream. And this is the idea that people want to use the computer to see themselves as whomever and whatever they want to be. And so I start with this you know, just because I was prompted in some way to, uh, to think big. This is a think out loud series. And to think about this kind of broad aspiration involving people that uh, use the computer in this kind of way. So the avatar dream has a couple of different components. So the first one is technical. Now, this is enabling users to control a virtual surrogate for themselves in some type of virtual environment or world. But there's another kind of component of this dream, which is experiential. And within this experiential component, it's the idea that people want to have experiences you know, beyond that that we encounter in our physical world. People want to have experiences that help them understand the experience of others or even other types of selves in the case, in the case of, say, fantastic games. So I you know, actually articulated this vision uh, just last year. This is Communications of the ACM, you know, one of the major computer science magazines. So this is the cover story from uh, last July. And it was an article called uh, Reimagining the Avatar Dream, Modeling Social Identity in Digital Media. And so what I contend within this article is that we re need to reimagine the avatar dream as one in which considering the socio-technical implications of this dream is intrinsic to the act of inventing it. And so to explain a little bit of what I mean by this, you can imagine any type of user like the youth that we have right here. And these days, nearly everybody has a virtual identity. And so a virtual identity means if you have a social media profile, if you play video games, if you have an avatar, if you have an online shopping account, you use a virtual identity. And given the widespread use of these kind of virtual identities, it's imperative to better understand their impacts and establish innovative and best practices in developing them. Yet at the same time, these pervasive virtual identities encode a number of different kind of social assumptions. So if you have this youth constructing a character in a mainstream uh, video game, you know, like a Final Fantasy series, then as you make choices about the way that you represent in the world, map your physical world self into this kind of environment, then we have different types of emergent phenomena that are actually reminiscent of phenomena that we've had in other environments. So probably many of you know this uh, image or this study. This is the famous Kenneth and Mamie Clark study from the 1940s in which African-American school children are asked questions like, which is the good baby doll, which is the nice baby doll, which is the baby doll like you. And most of the students, you can see which one they chose. Right? These were identically painted dolls. The only uh, the identical dolls, the only difference was the paint. You know, you know, one was a dark-skinned baby doll, and one was light. And essentially what's establishing is that under the worldview of the time, people even stigmatized their own uh, category. I mean, the case was taken up you know, with Brown versus Board of Education and, uh, and so on. And even some of these kids in the study, when they're asked which one is 
like you, even burst into tears because they had to map themselves into this kind of doll that they were using that didn't match their, you know, their identity. This has been much uh, uh, repeated. And this means that learners, uh, youth, users of these kind of systems have to decide how to present themselves in virtual environments in light of the kind of options that developers build into systems. And yeah, you must also think about any of the kind of biases that are built within, within these systems. So in this sense, what I'm talking about today is this fact that virtual identities impact many aspects of ourselves, our performance, our engagement, our sense of self, perspectives of others, and since biases can be embedded in virtual identity systems, it's imperative for developers to consider their social impacts. OK, a lot of different types of people are here. So I also have the too long, didn't read version of what I'll talk about today, which is I'm going to frame my work for you. And then I'm going to give you three examples of particular projects that, that we have done. So first, just to establish some baseline understanding of some terms that I'll use over the course of today, uh, I just want to mention what I mean by physical world identity. And so I use the term physical world identity in, co in contrast to virtual identity because the term real identity presupposes that experiences we have in the virtual environment are less real in some way than experiences we have in the physical world. So what that means is that it discounts the kind of cases where, say, somebody is you know, harassed online or bullied online or even bullied to the point of suicide, as, as occurs in some of the cases uh, that uh, you know, we know about uh, recently, these kind of harrowing cases. So I want to uh, question that kind of division between the virtual and the real, but then use a different definition here that physical world identities are these uh, kind of identity experiences that are informed by history, culture, and values in the physical world that often manifest in, user, in behaviors and actions. So then I use the term virtual identity in a more restricted kind of way. So what I mean are these computational implementations of surrogates or proxies for yourself the data structures used to construct these virtual representations, the algorithms that implement their functionality and affordances. And one of the things to note here is that these types of systems often share kind of technical components. If you're talking about a social media profile, you have your graphical image, you have numerical statistics such as numbers of posts and so, and so forth, you have network structure for affiliations, Video games are much the same. You might have stats for other sort of things, maybe they're kills or some other sort of uh, metric for this uh, video game. But on the back end, there actually is a lot of reciprocity between these types of systems. So then a blended identity, I think, is where a lot of the action is. So this is taking the cognitive science term uh, you know, from conceptual bending theory in which you selectively project uh, you know, into some uh, you know, two ideas into each other and generate new ideas. And it's the idea that we selectively project then from our physical world identity onto the virtual identity. So that means even in the case of an agent from a classic video game like Pac-Man, you're still projecting user agency and control of the system. Right? But a lot of times we think about systems like this, where you're constructing an avatar, but you're mapping some aspects of your physical world self, whether it's your preferences or other aspects of yourself, into the system, your, mor your moral choices, and so forth. And so after establishing just some of the terms for what I'm talking about, I just want to tell you a little bit about what I do overall. So yeah, I founded and directed the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Laboratory at MIT. And my lab designs and analyzes new forms of interactive narrative, video games, social media, and VR. And today I'll particularly talk to you about a subset of this research, which is focused on virtual identities. I've also founded a company recently, so that's just that's, you know that we're spinning out some of these kind of technologies uh, that are uh, grounded in our research to make social impact, say, in the kind of commercial industries around the, these topics. And I mentioned that because speaking about these commercial industries, you might say, why does this matter? Is this just fun and games? I, you know, I barely use social media, or you might think I don't play video games, or I've never used VR. Yeah? And so I just want to suggest it's a narrow lens, a narrow kind of proxy for the importance of this. Uh, uh, this work, but this is just uh, depicting the global revenue in terms of billions of dollars of the video game industry. And I also want to ask, uh, some people here will likely know this, but what do you think is the global revenue of the film industry in relation to the game industry? You can tell me when to stop. All right, yeah, so somebody stopped here. Somebody knows this. Well, people aren't familiar with the industry, 
aren't quite familiar that, in fact, uh, it's uh, even a little bit lower than people suggested. You know, but it means that the, if you go back to 2013, the global revenue of the film industry is just equivalent to that of mobile and handheld games, not even thinking about uh, consoles. Another important fact here is when you think about the demographics of users, you know, they're much more evenly distributed than a lot of people uh, imagine. They're not you know, obviously equal across a number of different normative demographic groups, but in terms of you know, gender, 56% of players, uh, male, 44% uh, female. You can see demographics of uh, adult users of video game sy systems, uh, and uh, you know, there's some degree of diversity that exists within these uh, systems. Social media usage, you know, likewise, when you look at the uptake of these technologies, 71% you know, of women, 62% of men. This is from the Pew Foundation. Uh, and similarly for particular kind of uh, platforms, a lot of uptake. But then when you look at the games themselves, this is from a survey of 150 best-selling console games, and you look at the demographics of the virtual representations, it's a different picture. Right, so you see 86% of the characters in the 150 best-selling console games are male. And you can see the demographic breakdown in terms of eth ethnicity, about 60% of them being identified as uh, white. And, uh, and you can see the other, uh, you know, the, some of the other demographic categories. But we haven't taken into account the fact that sports games have disproportionate representation of some groups. So when you move this, you know, then the demographic disparities become much more jarring. And even more than this, another study has shown that a similar study of best-selling uh, you know, properties, you know, then 90% of African-American female and 45% of white females are, are presented as uh, props or victims of violence within this uh, medium. So, I mean, these are issues that have been taken up you know, at the United Nations. 73% of women having faced online attacks, threats, cyber stalking. Women being 27 times, not percent, but times more likely to be victimized on the internet than men. So that's just to say that there's a kind of broad scope to the kind of issues that I'm discussing. And then you might even say, well, this is online impact, but research studies have shown, such as a uh, uh, colleague Jeremy Balenson at Stanford, and some of our own research uh, with education using avatars. Avatars, you know, in our research, we've shown avatars impact our performance, learning, and engagement. And computer science, if you have one between you and the medium, we've done crowdsourced studies of over 10,000 users. Balenson has shown that people change their real world behavior. If you use an attractive avatar, you're more willing to be close to people in terms of interpersonal distance than if you use a less attractive avatar. You use a tall avatar, you have more confidence in negotiations you know, and it's a persistent effect after you leave the virtual world. So one of the kind of things that we do in this work then is analyze these kind of virtual identity systems. That means, uh, uh, so this is a kind of surrogate. You know, it's a, you know, for using AI to analyze these systems. I mean, another way to think about it is we're using statistical methods, machine learning methods, but the community of practice that we operate in are people interested in AI applied to digital, digital media for generation or for analysis. We've used some deep learning kind of techniques. You know, so you might think about it, I mean, the, the labels, it's a shifting field, you know, but you could say applying statistical machine learning techniques to analyze this kind of uh, medium. So I want to show you a case study of a best-selling video game called Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. So the sequel to this game is, is you know, also well-known, Skyrim. And I mention it just because Skyrim, this is again, it's a narrow proxy for influence, but I think interesting nonetheless. Skyrim on its first day of release made about $217 million. Star Wars, the original Star Wars, but adjusted for inflation, so it's not an inflation trick, made $27 million on its best weekend ever. So that's about a factor of nine more uh, revenue being produced by uh, you know, a game in this series, even compared to a, a major feature film. And so one of the things we've been doing with you know, this kind of property is analyzing it. There's a lot of discussion about algorithmic bias. You know, we're actually using uh, statistical techniques to reveal bias within systems rather than encode bias within the systems. So this game, uh, for those, this is for those who aren't familiar, you have a wide degree of customization Show this. This is just the amount of customization just for your cheeks within the game, right? You know, so you can imagine you can spend hours customizing your character within within the game. So you have a large array of customization options: some human, non-human. 
Uh, an interesting thing is that the human categories, unlike other games, are kind of surrogates for real world categories. So the Imperials stand in for the Romans, the Bretons stand in for the French, the Nords stand in for Scandinavians and Norwegians. And you can allocate attributes uh, for your statistical, statistical abilities, um, you know, your dexterity, intelligence, speed, and so forth. And this has in-game effects for what you can do. So when you take a look at um, uh, here, these are the default stats according to race and gender within the game. I'll call your attention, this is low-hanging fruit before we even do our computational analysis. So you just notice right off the bat, particular races, females are more intelligent than their male counterparts by default, you know, by 10 points. Right. If you happen to be the... Uh, no, yeah, so here are the Red Guard, these are ostensibly African characters. By default, here you're 30 points intelligent in contrast to 50, which is your French counterpart within the game. Right, and these have impacts, you know, you know, as you practice abilities within the game experience, it actually gives you benefits even to your running and jumping abilities. So it's a kind of self-reinforcing cycle. And some people who are really into this kind of game contend, well, your stats can change with play, they can change over time. But studies of player types show that one dominant player type are achiever players that really want to maximize your abilities within the game. And for this kind of achiever player, this sort of thing makes a huge difference. It means that in order to maximize their gameplay, they'll choose their race or gender you know, uh, correspondingly. So I asked the question, could we then automatically discover developer embedded biases? So developers can fine tune their, you know, their, their software, understand the demographics they're serving or failing to serve. Yeah, so one of the things that we can uh, uh, then do, or apply some of the kind of techniques I, I mentioned, say uh, clustering techniques and so forth, in order to better understand this. And because I know it's an interdisciplinary audience here, I want to give you an overview of one of the clustering techniques that we use. Uh, you know, that we use uh, here. We use a lot of other. Uh, a lot of other techniques, some more sophisticated ones, some deep learning techniques, and so forth. But I want to just give you a sense for one of these techniques that I think you can, uh, it, it can capture in a very intuitive sense. So clustering, you know, I mean, that's well known. You're clustering your data set into different groups based on shared characteristics. Uh, you know, so we use an unsupervised uh, you know, uh, approach here, finding uh, characteristics intrinsic in the data without a training set for those characteristics. And one of the other kind of things you can do, though, is archetypal analysis. You know, that's also, we use an algorithm called non-negative matrix factorization to do this for those uh, interested. But what do you do instead of finding clusters based on shared attributes? Are you find extremal types within your data set? That's computing a convex hull around your data set. This kind of approach is, has been used recently in areas like sports analytics, in which you will find, you know, say, an extremal type might be something like a, a player that has stats that are high in every area. That would be, say, LeBron James. He's good at everything. Right? You have another one that's only good defensively, another one that's a bench warmer, that's kind of marginally in the league. And then you can describe every other player as, uh, uh, as you know, some percentage combination of each of these. You know, so another player might be 80% LeBron James and 20% the defensive player, or something like this. So one of the advantages is you're describing your data set in terms of actual individuals within the set. That makes it very intuitive for humans to understand, which isn't always the case with some other approaches like uh, principal component analysis. So just to give you another sense of this, so let's say we're classifying uh, birds. You know, so in the, uh, in the cognitive science of classification, there have been major studies in this you know, kind of area. So for our exercise, let's say one type of bird would be an extreme type of bird that talks, right? not a common type. Another one, a bird that just swims, that doesn't even fly as a kind of extremal type. And a bird that's angry and not even really a bird it could be some kind of extremal type. So the way to think about this uh, then would be, so something right in the middle, that's a penguin that talks and is really angry, <laughs> is uh, a kind of way that you might uh, think about this. Right, so what we did was apply this kind of technique to the default stats for race and gender in the Elder Scrolls game that I mentioned in order to find these extremal types. Also, the system, it does, you don't automatically get the K, the number of, uh, the, uh, the number of vertices here in your convex hull. You know, that, you, know, you actually need some sophisticated, sophisticated techniques to find what's the optimal K to describe your, your, your data set. But fortunately, in this case, we actually found that a K of three described our data set for the default 
uh, you know, for the default stats for race and gender. And these correspond to an intelligence-oriented orient set of stats, a uh, strength-oriented set of stats, and a stealth-oriented set of stats, which nicely corresponds. I mean, it would be bad if the data, I mean, this isn't our glass. This just emerged from the data. But these are major play patterns within this type of game. So it's good that the data came out in this kind of way. So this is a ternary plot diagram that's showing these three archetypes. And we plotted out all of the default stats in terms of uh, race and gender. So the females are represented as black dots, male as red dots. And so some of the kind of things you can read right off here is you see that with these three extremal types, then female characters are only optimized to play one of these types, which is a sneaky thief type. So if you want to play as an intelligence-oriented character or strength-oriented character, you're never going to be optimized to play that kind of character if you take a female character within this particular game. So to me, that's interesting. You know, that's something that you can't just read straight off in the way that I did the difference of stats you know, when I mentioned some characters are less intelligent than, than others. Another kind of observation is this. You know, so you take a look at the Nords and the Red Guards here. You see they're entirely along uh, you know, this axis. That means that they are associated only with the strength archetype within this game and not at all with the intelligence wisdom archetype. Right. So that means if you play as a Scandinavian or an African character you know, within this game, then again, you're not going to be optimized to play in terms of uh, intelligence-oriented uh, character. So to me, this is a kind of example of system embedded bias, right? That is using these kind of systems to reveal implicit bias in large data sets. And so these are kind of biases that are built into infrastructure. I mean, this is an example taken from apartheid South Africa, just showing, again, the way that biases find their way into social infrastructure. But in this case, the biases find their way not into visual data and uh, not into physical infrastructure, but into the underlying computational infrastructure of, of the system. Another sort of thing I think is interesting is that these kind of biases are often seen as being subjective and cultural phenomena. People discuss them anecdotally. They're not often seen as a kind of subjects that are amenable to computational analysis in, in, in this kind of way. So another way to think about what we're doing here uh, are providing uh, a, a kind of compatible additional source of data you know, uh, that can complement the kind of analyses that come in from other, uh, other disciplines that uh, address these kind of issues. So some of the kind of impacts of this kind of work, systems can serve larger, broader sets of uh, users. Designers have techniques to ensure equity of their systems. I mean, for those are altruistically motivated or even uh, uh, just for calibrating the, you know, the system, that's uh, useful. And policymakers now also can have quantitative empirical evidence to support assessments and ratings of media. So famously, there was a lot of discussion of games like Grand Theft Auto being lined in, in the media and so on. But a lot of these arguments are, again, anecdotal and knee-jerk reactions rather than something which is uh, supported by this kind of empirical evidence. So the other kind of thing that we do in my lab that I mentioned is designing systems that address virtual identity. And so uh, I'll talk just about two of those. That was the first of the case studies I mentioned in the too long didn't read summary. Uh, and uh, so, but I'll just tell you about a couple of others before I do this. So we built you know, uh, interactive narrative work about racial microaggressions. We take a, a racial microaggression model from clinical psychology, build that into a system. So you play as a mimic octopus. That's a kind of creature that can emulate other creatures. Then you encounter sea creatures that each are surrogates or stand-ins for one form of microaggression. So racial microaggression being the kind of, uh, say, covert discrimination that's often dismissed as minimally harmful, but, uh, but actually has impacts to health, happiness, in terms of depression, stress, and, and so forth. And so these sea creatures, you see the caption, sorry we don't get that many octopuses around here. This one stands for the stranger in one's own land microaggression. And we have others, like ascription of skill for model minorities. You must be good at math, you know, this sort of thing, or assumption of criminality. And people respond to these in a, in a set of uniform ways, gen generally. One is being oblivious, you know, but you also have confusion. Did something discriminatory just happen? Suspicion, I think that something just happened, but I don't have the vocabulary to intervene. 
and aggression, which is when you kind of take an active action against it, but then you're suspect to seeing discrimination where others might claim it doesn't exist. Uh, so that, that's just one of the systems. I won't get too much into uh, depth. We build other systems. This is one called Gatekeeper that models the sociologist Irving Goffman's theory of uh, impression management. You try to talk your way into a castle with somebody from a group that's very different than you. Uh, you play as a kind of uh, elf-like character. The guard is a kind of hobbit-like character. And we model a number of phenomena, such as passing, you know, that is, uh, taking on uh, you know, the mantle of, a, of an identity that is seen as separate from yours, a lot of times in order to gain some social advantage, capital, or access. But we have other kind of phenomena that Goffman identifies. Let's say you act entirely the way that uh, Elf is supposed to act, expected to act within the system. Uh, and uh, uh, you might have a reaction. You think you're not going to get in, but it says, great, please come in. It's great to have a little bit. We call the Elf Sylvans. It's great to have a little Sylvan flavor here, which is called stigma allure in this. You know, that is a kind of allure to the stigmatized category. But the interesting thing about this work is we didn't just build a one-off game, a one-off kind of visual novel style game. We actually built an engine that mathematically models your membership in categories with features of category gradients, degrees of membership in categories, what we call naturalization trajectories, your trajectory of membership in categories over time, multiple mem membership in categories. Uh, and, and so there's actually a kind of platform and engine underneath this that is used so that you don't have to hard code this kind of content. You're actually simulating this content based on this underlying uh, model. We've used it in recommendation systems. So this is not a game-like system, but it's a, a system that has a bot that generates kind of music recommendations. You're classified into in, you know, use, being a fan of different types of music using the themes, moods, and genres of this music. And it generates a conversational narrative that is, as you change, you know, so it says up here, well, that's odd. You said you just like, you like Jimi Hendrix, but now you seem to like jazz. So you're actually having the bot respond to the fluctuating trajectory of your membership in these kind of categories. So if you're interested, you can ask me more about those uh, systems. Uh, but essentially, we have an uh, uh, engine that has a category membership model based upon the work of uh, researchers like, uh, you know, like, like George Lakoff and uh, others in cognitive science, lingu cognitive linguistics. We have a narrative generation model. That's a sociolinguistics model of narrative of personal experience. It can be ex extended. We can use data-driven assets, author-specified assets, GUI for implementing these systems. So this is the platform I actually use in teaching that was used to implement the next system that I'll show you. So we implemented a system called Grayscale, which is aimed at modeling a phenomenon called ambivalent sexism. So this is one of a kind of predominant social scientific model of sexism from 1990, 1996. Uh, and the idea is that it differentiates between what's so-called hostile sexism and what's seen as benevolent sexism. Uh, that's not benevolent in the sense that it's helpful, good, or useful, but more like benevolent dictators. It's actually oppressive, but has a kind of patina uh, of uh, subtlety and uh, complementarity on it. And so in, in fact, the researchers invented this, use the term benevolent with some trepidation, you know, but, it, it, but it conveys the sense of issues like complementary gender differentiation. You must be so uh, yeah, yeah, empathic. You must have you know, this, 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 sort of, uh, this sort of thing that could be uh, applied to women that sounds complementary, but in fact is oppressive in a practice. So the system grayscale, uh, here's an example of the login screen. Uh, so you, you log in. You choose a color for the interface, and that's, that determines what your particular uh, representation will look like. It looks like a streamlined uh, email interface. Right? It's based on well-known interfaces. We wanted people to feel as if they were in a naturalistic setting where they might encounter issues like sexual harassment. And you get messages that come in over time. You have to respond to these kind of messages. They're encoded with different types of sexism underneath this kind of model. You know, so, the, you know, so all of the utterances are labeled with this kind of representation. And you play as a temporary human resources manager that has to field all of these events that are coming in. So you can navigate uh, you know, your, 
And if you're interested, I can also show, you know, show some of this live after the talk. If you want, I'll just pop up a browser. You know, but you have your spam box, your notes on other employees. All of that is active. You, you can navigate. And so you have different types of messages that come in. This one I, you know, I took just because people find it interesting. <laughs> and so our company has a dress code for a reason. Somebody named Rob writes to the entire office list, Yoga pants are A, unprofessional, and B, distracting. This is an office, not a gym, he says. Please show some respect for your coworkers and yourself. So when something like that comes in, you have to think, what do you do as an HR manager? So you could do things. You know, so you have a set of choices, as if you had pre-written emails in your inbox. You're choosing which one to send. So you can say something like, it's not your responsibility to police your coworkers' clothing. If you believe that someone's dressing in a way that violates company policy, please bring it, bring it up with HR, you know, not with me. Or you could do something like this. Comments about your co coworkers' attire being uh, distracting or not appropriate for the space. So you have a kind of choice of how you want to respond within, uh, w within, this, uh, w within the system. And actually, what I think I will do is just let you, you, know, let you see a little. So you get, you, get, you get a sense uh, here, you, know, you can look at the spam, you have some embedded narrative, so typical spam. <laughs> right. You have notes on your other coworkers, oh, Stan, Stan, he's not a friendly guy. <laughs> right, so you have this kind of backstory as you navigate the space. You have to mess answer messages like, uh, uh, like, like this, high priority. So messages come in, I mean, there's well-known research that suggests due to innate temperature differences in apparel and so forth, that office temperatures tend to be calibrated for men rather than for women. So that's a first kind of gentle introduction to this kind of theme where someone says to turn up the temperature. And you have your choice of different kind of options. Right. Like the African-American school child I mentioned, uh, earlier, you know, that actually had stigma against his own category. Obviously, sexism is not something that's only exclusive to one uh, gender. So you have uh, two women in the office here, Tammy and Barbara, that are arguing because uh, uh, you know, one is within company policy, the other one thinks she's not carrying her weight. So you have different kind of uh, responses, ranging from calling her overly dramatic to saying she's not being uh, sensitive you know, about this. So with every choice, it's modeling our trajectory in terms of which type of sexism we're exhibiting or not exhibiting. Who's hot or not list in the men's room. And so it, and so it goes on like this. You know, there, there's a number of different kind of events that take place. And by the end of the experience, then uh, well, I'll give you a sense of that in a moment. So this is just to show you a little bit about the implementation of the back end model. It has these different types of uh, subcategories of ambivalent sexism, such as complementary gender differentiation, protective paternalism, you know, the fallouts of heterosexual in in intimacy within a kind of ambivalent sexist uh, workplace. And we're tracing the trajectory of users as they you know, work. This is a very simple trajectory, just monotonically increasing. And so if you, exhibit protective paternalism past a certain kind of threshold, then you'd fit within this kind of category and trigger certain eventualities. There's actually a huge number of kind of eventual stories as you go through this, uh, net, you know, this network, and also a number of thematic endings. So based upon your trajectory, say whether it's fluctuating ambivalent sexist within some threshold for hostile sexist yeah, and so on, you might have endings of a type like this Grayscale has concluded that morale at your branch might have been better if you had intervened more in your role as a temp, a manager of human resources. Current issues going on are the sorts of things that lead to very bad press. Do something about this quickly or there will be consequences. So that's if hostile behavior being discouraged for the wrong reasons within the workplace. So also, it appears your, this is another one, your management has been working, uh, your strategy has been working for, for now. 
things are going well in your branch, essentially. But if this trend doesn't persist, we might have to go back to the old way of doing things. So there's a kind of ambivalence in the kind of response in terms of your outcome, as well as uh, responding to whether or not you are an advocate about these kind of uh, issues. So the way that we think about this is because people use terms like, like empathy, is this empathy building, or like what's the aim of this, this kind of work? And I actually think it's not something like triggering a kind of affective response that now you can understand what it feels like to be in another category, anything like this. Actually, the assessment models we use are you know, multiple. So we use validated instruments to see that the experience is uh, immersive. We have uh, a, kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of game experience questionnaires, validated instruments. We have other things like this. We look for reflective engagement, so that's self-reported evidence of reflection as people use this kind of system. Uh, and this kind of transformative reflection, you might think about it in this way. Let's say if you have a youth that plays a game which is teaching uh, uh, a natural science subject, like insect metamorphosis, the aim is not for her to know what it feels like to be a butterfly, obviously, all right? The aim is something more like this. Now, she has this kind of cycle that she can then apply out in the world when she sees other kind of insects in this metamorphosis cycle. She has this kind of model that she can then go and test in the world. Right, it's not, uh, and similarly, we think about it this way. When using a system like grayscale, then a kind of optimal outcome would be somebody has a tool to think with. Right? You know, that means that you have this ambivalent sexism model that you can then go apply, test, and so forth out in the world. So it also doesn't mean that we just wholeheartedly subscribe to one particular kind of model, but an advantage of our approach with platform building is you could substitute another social scientific model on top of this using our infrastructure and model that within your next version and actually have a kind of testing ground. We're doing that in VR with models of racial and ethnic socialization with social scientists at the University of Southern California and a developing project. So I'll conclude by talking about just one other project, which is a more kind of creative project, I uh, collaborated with a war photo journalist named Kareem Ben Khalifa. Uh, he's been in a lot of the major war uh, uh, regions. Uh, so uh, you know, he, he's been in the Balkans, in Gaza, with gangs of El Salvador, East Congo. His work has been published in a lot of the major periodicals, the New York Times, New Yorker, Le Monde, and so on. And he became dissatisfied with the way that his photographs are taken up when they're published in these periodicals because they're paired with an article, say Associated Press article, that isn't one that necessarily corresponds to what he experienced on the ground. So with that dissatisfaction, he began thinking, how can I begin to convey what my experience was? He began doing portraits of soldiers, one on the other side of the wall. This is non-digital you know, outside of using a SLR camera and asking them basic questions like, why do you fight? Have you killed before? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? What is peace for you? What is war for you? And so that was the kind of installation work. You know, he did a fellowship, a uh, Neiman fellowship at Harvard, saw virtual reality for the first time, almost dismissed it, but then thought, maybe we can, I could do something with this technology. And so prototyped a system with uh, uh, resources. And I met him, wrote a grant to bring him in as a visiting artist. You know, I mean, actually, he thought me out. People kept saying, if you're doing work in interactive narrative, you know, then um, you know, that I do work in this area. And so he knocked on my door. I found synergy with the kind of things he was interested in, wrote the grant to bring him back as a visiting artist, and we began collaborating to make the model more, the interactive narrative model more dynamic so your presence has an effect within the, within the game world. So the work has, it's, it's been quite well received, I mean, written up in a, in, a number of, in, in a number of places. I think one of the reasons is that it's using VR for a kind of intimate engagement rather than spectacle, right? It's not, a, it's not something uh, you know, that's you know, putting us in a roller coaster or something you know, like this. You know, it's, measuring you, but your agent, so my component that I added to the system was as you, first you pre-register for it, and so you know, that gives you some sense of how close people are to particular con conflicts, what your biases are, so that's self-reported bias as it relates to those conflicts. That allows us to do things like not trigger certain kind of sounds if somebody has experience of war, and kind, of, you know, kind of environmental cues. You, know, you can also then sequence it so the conflict you're most familiar with it comes last, so we can do things like this. But then also at real time, we measure proxies for your nervousness, your attention, and your bias as you use the system. And so those change effects like staging. You know, that includes 
the ambient light within the room, the skylight. If you're nervous over a period of time, then cloud cover comes in, you can see through the skylight. It feels like a day where the clouds obscure the sun. It just darkens for a moment if you're uh, inattentive. Uh, it, can, uh, it, it will lighten if you are attentive. You, know, you get feedback after interactions. I, know you, I noticed you listened more to one than to the other, so it caused you to reflect a bit about your experience there. And then by the very end, you're moving. Yeah, I should say that, you know, that it's been shown in a lot of places, the MIT Museum in Tel Aviv in France, the throughput, hundreds of people per day in cohorts of 15, five people at a time staggered, so 15 total in the system. You see the other people as virtually embodied characters, so you don't you know, bump into them, so you see transparent uh, representations of them. And at the end of the experience, then you see a virtual mirror, and you realize that it's a combatant there, but it's you because it's mirroring your images, and you have become the person that you are least comfortable with as you go through the experience. So to give you just, you know, this is uh, you know, a sense of what it looks like here. It's actually a very large space in terms of physical space. You can see the skylights. You might not even notice them if you're in there, uh, but it changes the ambient you know, light. There's also augmented reality version of this that was produced with some support from the National Film Board of Canada. And you also have digital media applications that can call attention to the fact, I mean, the war in Congo, these, the combatants were interviewed, you know, say, right outside the mine. The, you know, I mean, the war there is about natural resources or, in fact, used to, to create devices like this one that I'm using to guide the presentation. So you want people to think about their implication in the conflict, too. So you can also get in, information about the conflict uh, as well. And so that gives just a, a little bit of a, a sense of the kind of range of applications that this is. I want to show, uh, you know, uh, trailer that just will, I mean, it's a promotional trailer, but it gives a sense of what the uh, what the work looks like before before concluding here. was born out of my frustration as a photojournalist and war correspondent. For almost 20 years, I have photographed conflicts and witnessed the consequences of huge geopolitical shifts. When I became a father, I simply knew I could not keep working on the front lines. Yet, I was not done trying to understand wars. Oh, me na ba waka ju na buba na ni waka. My friends in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza can't help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. Also, when I spend weeks working in Gaza and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me the exact same thing. Be careful there. The project is rooted in my experience as a war photographer going from one side of the front line to the other and finding that the fighters' dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and this is the one I want to explore and share. For the enemy, I am using the latest technologies in virtual and augmented realities so you can engage directly with the combatants and meet them, hear them, and feel them the way I did. In many parts of our world, you create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side?
just a few remarks about, uh, about, about the work. So you know, one is we wanted to give users some kind of agency over the experience, but we, but we also didn't want it to be anything like a game-like experience. Yeah, so that's why we have some of the kind of ambient, you know, the kind of ambient measures that we did for uh, user engagement, bias, and nervousness, and, and, uh, and so on. The kind of environment, you can ask me about why we chose that environment after some, degree, some sets of user testing. Uh, uh, and you know, we, t we also exp experimented with and explored different forms of feedback. You know, how should we use biometric feedback, other kind of feedback that can be read directly from the Oculus Rift and, uh, and, and so forth. Opted for Oculus Rift data because that can be used for high throughput in the museum. But more than that, you can think uh, just anecdotally about some of the impacts here. Like I said, this is not one of my research projects. This is a kind of artistic project. One is when we were interviewed by Randy Kennedy from the New York Times, and Kareem asked him, is this journalism? He said, unquestionably so, because it's faithful to all of the body language of the soldiers themselves, outside of eye tracking, that they follow you and call you over. All the body language, how they stand, how they move, that's been uh, captured uh, there. You know, so it gives you a kind of embodied sense of the, of the combatants within, within the space. Uh, and they've even gone through it themselves. I mean, it's you know, not just using them as subjects. They know about the work. They're complicit in the aims of, uh, of, of the work. I mean, one of the major aims is, that, is the way that necessary conditions for war are dehumanizing the other. So what does it mean then to humanize particular uh, individuals? And after one period of intense conflict, this is Gilad, who is uh, Israeli. This, that's uh, Abu Khaled, who is a Palestinian. So Kareem called them both up after this period of conflict to ask, okay, are you okay physically? Are you okay mentally? Certainly there was shock there. He spoke to both of them. More or less, they were okay. And one of the things that, uh, that was striking that I always remember was that at the end of the conversation, uh, Gilad said to Kareem, I have one more question for you. And that question is, how is Abu Khalid? And so for us, we were floored in a way, you know, because at the beginning, he just dismissed it. He just said, they all say the same thing, you know, this, this, sort of, you know, this sort of experience. And then by the end, you know, they have him asking about the welfare of the enemy, not just as a creator of the project, you know, you know, that, you know, that was, uh, was a, a, a kind of significant, if uh, anecdotal moment for us. So one of the kind of reasons to do this kind of work, grayscale or, uh, or the enemy, you know, that is, First, inventing new forms of art, entertainment, journalism, and, and so on. That is, educating in the kind of critical pedagogy sense, taking up people's themes and kind of horizontal uh, learning you know, with people about crucial social issues in an engaging, reflective way. I mean, I myself and all the faculty members at MIT, I think here too, had to undertake sexual harassment training recently. It's a kind of, uh, I mean, it's utilitarian, you know, but it's more kind of corporate cookie cutter type of system. So if you can actually engage with people reflectively about these issues, that actually leads to longer lasting change, at least the kind of research and advertising uh, about uh, the kind of uh, a central path of persuasion it suggests that when people actually think through something, it's more there are more longitudinal effects. And then also you can simulate social phenomena as a means of social science research, uh, you know, like the project I'm mentioning that we're undertaking with, uh, you know, with, with USC. You can actually test and simulate this kind of salient aspects of particular models so, uh, you know, from social sciences. So if you remember this, you know, I framed the work with the discussion of the avatar dream. You know, I spoke to you about virtual identities, some of the ways that biases are embedded within systems. Right? So that was a kind of framing why it's important, the kind of scope of these kind of issues. And I shared three projects. You know, one project was a kind of analysis using archetypal analysis to look at the video game. I mentioned we use other works like deep learning to look at avatars collected internationally. We've applied the same technique to Instagram data in the Middle East, hundreds of thousands of profiles. Uh, and uh, then we had, I showed you the grayscale system and the enemy system. So if you remember this, I would like to think that this will feel uh, you know, something more salient to you than at the beginning. The virtual identities impact our performance, our engagement, our senses of self, and our perspectives of others. Since biases can be embedded in virtual identity technologies, it's imperative for digital storytellers to consider their social impacts. Right, and when you think back to what I said at the very beginning, this avatar dream, people want to use the computer to see themselves as whomever or whatever they want to be. Then I would conclude by contending that we should in fact reimagine the avatar dream as one in which uh, it, it could be an empowering vision in which consideration of its social impacts is intrinsic to the act of inventing it. So thank you very much.
mics here. I can throw them at you, or you can go grab them, or you know whatever you'd like to do. So, questions? I just had a question about your slide earlier on <coughs> gamers and the demographics. Yes. Can you go back to that? Is that mainly North American data, or is that worldwide? All right. That's North American data. Okay. Yes. Right. Although I've been doing work, you know, recently in. Uh, uh, Fox, the, could you repeat the question? Oh, so the, the question was, uh, is the data you know, there about gamer demographics, North American data? I mean, so the in-game data, console games, I mean, that's, uh, that's international because the games are used across, uh, across uh, international markets. The data about demographics, uh, you know, that's uh, US data. But at the same time, we've been doing work within the Middle East, within you know, the, the Gulf region, the Middle East and North Africa. And we actually find that there's quite a similar type of uptake there, you know, but so I'm working with both social scientists and the data scientists, you know, analyzing this. But there's different types of phenomena that then emerge. So just to give one you know, one that came out in our interview data, you have cases where, say, a Qatari woman is using a first-person shooter game, and she helps somebody within the game uh, you know, that say needs healing. This person, uh, and she helps them because she can hear that he's speaking Arabic within the experience. So she ends up. Uh, healing him, he says that, oh, I notice you're speaking Arabic. Uh, um, you know, where are you from? She says, I'm Qatari. And his response is, okay, well, I thought that Qatari girls are better than that, right? You know, because she's crossing the kind of mahram, non mahram divide. That's a kind of in family, out of family divide. But it's not cut and dry. You know, it's the voice was the divide. Playing the game you know, online with others is not a part of it. So we actually, it's not only a matter of the kind of demographic uptake, even if you have great amount of uptake within, uh, within regions, there are nuanced kind of concerns across the kind of, kind of international you know, boundaries, you know, kind of irregardless of the number of people using them that have to be designed for, that are undesigned, underdesigned for uh, in, in a lot of these systems now. One thing I will mention, uh, what was interesting about the talk is that you are dealing with social issues and uh, societal issues and social interactions, but uh, also for you know the students here and some of the professors, there's there's a Maserati of computer science and engineering under the hood there. So don't be afraid to ask about that. Uh, first, thank you for the talk. Is the the trailer was especially touching. Um, Thank you. But uh, I believe I have a question about how your kind of empirical studies of um, of the bias in video games, and I'm wondering what you think the possibility is for using those kinds of strategies for social media. So, like, um, kind of monitoring like censorship and moderation in forums and on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, right, so the, the question is about applying some of these kind of techniques in social media as well as within uh, games, and then particularly you're interested in issues of moderation. Uh, so, I mean, I know in terms of moderation, there's a great social scientist named Kishona Gray that has done a lot of work for kind of how communities self regulate, what kind of social issues can be talked about within communities and not be, you know, be discussed within communities. You know, but in terms of applying those techniques to uh, social media. So we've actually done some work in that uh, that regard. I'll just quickly uh, uh, mention. You know, so we've done study. You know, so manual analysis of about 255 users of Instagram. You know, this is in the Middle East in uh, uh, Qatar, you know, and we've also applied this kind of analysis to hundreds of thousands of profiles on Instagram you know, there. And so, you know, you know, so starting with qualitative analysis semi-structured interview, uh, interviews you know, uh, for kind of rich discourse to talk about this, but, but primarily a kind of hand-coded data you know, uh, about, uh, about this. And so that ends up revealed, so that on, this, on this qualitative side, themes that people want to use, you know, kind of culturally specific uh, technologies, you know, people are concerned about kind of you know, the, the kind of monitoring, but it's also expected you know, uh, with, within these kind of spaces, a kind of pure monitoring, not just kind of monitoring by systems. Self-expression, you know, so people want you know, to create a kind of likeness with kind of features that are salient for them, you know, facilitate social connections in particular ways, and so on. But in terms of using this kind of technique, now, so this is one example. You know, so we looked at a number of profiles, you know, also in internationally. You find clusters. You have a higher number of clusters than you do with uh, you know, what, what I showed. But you can find clusters of image types. That looks like, you know, like, you know, like this.
Right, and so you can see there's some noise in the data, but at the same time, we can find trends within this kind of data. And so here, using just low-level visual features, you find that uh, you have some kind of thematic photos, like romantic photos. We actually found a number of different kind of categories, some illustrated kind of images. You have text-based images and so on. So this is each row represents one of the kind of clusters. And here is the kind of prototype you know, you know, that's akin to the ones I discussed earlier. And what we can find then, we align the qualitative and quantitative data, uh, is that you know, so some of the kind of clusters we found, typographic representations, commercial representations, religious, thematic, illustrative images, you know, like avatar or me type images, selfies, and then for males, non-traditional, say wearing um, you know, a, a suit or wearing uh, traditional clothing you know, there. And, then we can and we also then find the reason why people are using these. And so essentially the aim with this kind of work is to find now what are some of the kind of ways that we can support users in the region for negotiating your identity if the technology is not designed with those needs and values of the culture in mind. So a lot of the kind of analysis in the region is actually doing something like you mentioned. Uh, I mean, social computing analysis, a lot of people have focused on Arab Spring, I think, and rightly necessarily so. But we were more interested in the kind of everyday social media use across uh, international lines. And so what you could suggest are you know, ways you know, through you know, uh, automation or other, uh, uh, and, uh, other types of you know, say, you know, moderate, you know, moderation and so forth, you know, say, you know, should somebody have the option for a kind of voice altering system? You know, then the person I mentioned earlier anecdotally could in fact play without violating cultural norms. But then you ask, have to ask the issue if you provide both options, like what kind of norms are you reinforcing? So you actually want to give people the tools to navigate those cultural norms in ways that make sense for them rather than just reinforcing some kind of external bias. But in this kind of way, we can at least end up trying to better understand what are some of those kind of needs, values, and practices. So that's just to give another kind of example. You know, it's totally outside of the game realm using a much larger data set. We've also looked internationally, people who have constructed hundreds of thousands of Nintendo Miis. There we can look for novelty across international boundaries. In some areas, people tend to have more uniform types of avatar creation. Some people have more boundary and kind of novel types. We can ask questions why that is and so on. So we've actually applied this in, in a number of different kind of in different kind of settings. But anyway, this is one illustration that answers your question. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Here's an off the wall question for you. So when you encounter an intergenerational conflict like Parkland, um, how do you think about that in terms of a population who's more familiar with avatars and avatar dreams dealing with another population that's not? And when you encounter situations like that, uh, how do you begin to think about applying your technique to conflict resolution? Right, uh, uh, thanks for the question. And you know, so it's one is about kind of interge intergenerational use of these kind of technologies, you know, issues of digital divide across you know, age demographics, essentially, and how that impacts the users of these kind of technologies. And one, I think it's gracious for you to call the enemy a conflict resolution <laughs> system, where I mean, we're doing work in Gaza and other areas. So I mean, there's no resolution in the kind of work that we're doing. You know? And in some sense, you know, there's a kind of challenge with that kind of engagement because we're looking at kind of fundamental issues about just the necessary conditions for conflict in terms of dehumanization. You know, so it's you know, you know besides inter intergenerational kind of users, I mean, there's intergenerational conflict. You don't want to ignore the kind of conditions of the conflict itself as well. But in terms of uptake, one of the aims here could be next generation of fighters for whom are engaged in this kind of technology, if it could have some kind of impact on them, there might be a seductive layer of the technology to begin with, but you get in and are engaged reflectively. Because you know, the, you know, Jean Didou and Pashyant, those are the fighters in Congo, Abu Khalid and Gilad, they're you know, already implicated within the conflict. But the next generation you know, might have some kind of spark or reflective engagement that we think uh, could be uh, important. So that's one aspect of that in terms of structuring the target audience. 
The other thing is that even in digital media, there are various, you could say, generations of people that were you know, kind of aspiring to the avatar dream. So if you go back to early social media, like the well from the, you know, from the 90s, you know, this is in Silicon Valley, you know, you know, online, uh, online social network system. You know, I mean, before these were graphical systems or anything like this. Then, and you had to use your real name within the system as well. You might imagine that, okay, well, this is just a proxy for your physical world self, right? It's not, nothing like the avatar dream. But in fact, when you read that literature about the well, people would say things you know, such as, I mean, quotes in periodicals of the time that using this technology, you can be whoever you want to be inside this technology because you can customize your personality, your post. You can basically curate the way that you're interacting with other people within the system. And so that means that this idea of the avatar dream, I mean, I give it this, I mean, it's you know, this you know, label, but actually I mean really using any computational proxy for yourself. And another kind of article that got a lot of attention, uh, uh, this is now decades ago, was a bit of a harrowing article in the Village Voice called A Rape in Cyberspace by uh, Julian Devil. And so you know, that was one when somebody was online using uh, you know, a MUD, kind of like a precursor to World of Warcraft type games, text only. And somebody took control of their avatar and began uh, harassing them in kind of obscene ways. And there's a kind of yeah, uh, impact you know, to the user of the system. I mean, it was traumatic, in fact, but still so distinct from the physical world kind of impact. And so began asking questions about this even at that time where people didn't have uptake of technologies in large numbers, like kind of virtual reality technologies that I mentioned. And then finally, I mean, I think that, I mean, people project themselves into other types of surrogates in a number of ways. I mean, you can think about avatars as a kind of prosthesis in, 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 in some kind of way. You know, so I don't think that all of the kind of discussion that I mentioned here pertains only to digital technologies, but I focused on digital technologies because of some specifically computational insights we can gain, which are about the underlying data structures, not just kind of body image issues, you know, you know, the kind of algorithmic bias and so forth. So I focus on those technologies for that reason. But I think a lot of the underlying themes about the way that infrastructures encode bias could certainly be applied to other kind of areas too, which I think would have some kind of interge intergenerational impact. Um, I had a question about, um, so like digital or, or virtual communities in which a lot of the, um, like the, the power in terms of like where, where values and, um, where I guess like points, so to speak, are, are distributed is actually dependent not on uh, the developer of the platform, but on the, the members of the community and the strength that they have in in mass over the community. So, um, in you know social networks, but like otherwise, um, where it's the case that um, your empowerment or um, or otherwise isn't dependent on what the developers um, set out in terms of rules, but it's sort of just a free for all and and it's dependent on the way that other people interact with you. Um, what do you imagine are um, possible solutions to feeling um, less than empowered uh, in that sort of situation? And how can those interactions be redesigned? I think it's, it's a great question. So this question is about systems in which your virtual representation is co-constructed by the community. So in Reddit, you get upvotes in eBay, you, know, you, you, you get seller ratings or buyer ratings and, uh, and so forth. So in some other kind of talks about this, one of the things that I set out is you know, mentioning that there are some of these kind of topics that are well known and studied by people in the humanities and social sciences, and we're beginning to look at these in computational realms. And so some of those kind of themes that you mentioned, uh, you could describe as a kind of new phenomenon in terms of the back end you know, structure and the way it's manifested. But when you think about how the community sees you in contrast to how you see yourself, you can go back to 1903 and W.E.B. Du Bois and the idea of double consciousness, right? So that's you know, uh, basically is society sees you in one way, whatever stigmatized category that you're in, and you see yourself in a different way, and you're constantly negotiating between the two of those. You know, so that's one. Uh, another is, you know, so moving, so jump 50 years or so, and Irving Goffman uh, in the construction, you know, the self, you know, the presentation of self in everyday life 
talks about a dra dramaturgical self. You know, so this is a self that is staged and you kind of manage the impressions that others have of you in different circumstances. So it's the idea you have a different self that you're using and deploying, say, on one platform or another. It could be a way to think about this now. In 1999, Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr talk about identity torque, which is when you have a kind of social infrastructure that classifies people and you feel that your identity does not correspond to the way that you've been classified and there are, person, there are effects on your physical world life, you know, life and livelihood, like in apartheid South Africa, where you have to carry around a booklet that has information about your social affiliation and classification uh, according to this infrastructure. Even you know, you, you, you're comparing your skin tone against a chart to see what group you're in. Uh, uh, so that's another case you know, of a theory in which you're looking at how society sees you differently than you see yourself. And then finally, in the article from the communication of the ACM, uh, I mentioned box effects is a term I use, which is the, the failure of classification systems in light of the biography of individuals you know, that, you know, that is a fallout from limits of the classification system. So that means just that, first of all, there's a lot of discussion of these kind of topics uh, to begin with, and they're just manifesting again online. But there are particular formations of them that occur that also are different than pre pri prior media. So we've done some types of work that intervene in different types of ways. So one is you had a system that was a Facebook plugin where your profile would be co-constructed by you and your friends. So your friends could say things about you within the system, and you could also say things about yourself. So we had in features you know, for moderation, so that you know, when you know, you know, you know, so you can uh, you know, remove the data that other people post about you with, within the system. You can change you know, for whom the data is uh, is displayed. Basically, it would come up with an avatar for you automatically based upon what everybody said about you. If you are smart as a whip and courageous as a lion and so on, it would construct this kind of avatar for you as a kind of experiment. Yeah, so, but we had to put in a lot of features that would present, prevent this from being uh, uh, abused in a number of ways. I think the kind of techniques that I mentioned here too, you know, that you know, for uh, analysis, you know, so, you know, you can actually do things uh, like we've scrutinized social media uh, data in terms of classifying users into how they're performing their status online through the, op you know, the, option, the objects that they show and uh, understanding how people are classified into bins you know this way if you can provide developers with this kind of tool you can also use these tools to help with moderation in these in these kind of communities uh, as well uh, you know that's one kind of option another i'll just give one more and then, and then go on another one is yeah, and this is not only involved with community uh, co-representation but why we said what can we do how can we empower people we've done i mentioned crowdsource studies of over ten thousand users of a computer science learning game platform that we created where students can also construct their own games using this platform. You have to write small programs in order to, to navigate, you know, but you can also, in order to navigate, move your character through the maze, but then you also can create your own, you know, your own uh, you know, devices. And we use that to study how the avatar you use impacts your performance and engagement in the area. And so one of the best conditions that we looked at if you use anthropomorphic versus non-anthropomorphic, you know, abstract versus likeness avatars, role model avatars, role model avatars that you select, role model avatars that the system selects, one of the best performing conditions was the one where you're performing well, the avatar looks like you, and when you're not performing well, you have an abstracted, or you can even have an absent avatar there, just text in a geometric shape. Right. And so this, this kind of system, actually people were more engaged and performed better in this kind of uh, case because we think a few things, you're mitigating against stereotype threats, you're not going to conform to the stereotypes people have of you, and you can actually change the perspective of the category you know, that you are in and of yourself to using this kind of condition. So that's some of the kind of work actually doing studies to find what are the conditions under which people perform or engage kind of, you know, more optimally uh, as, as well. I, um, I'm very interested in like exploring like different ways of manifesting an avatar. I, I think the dominant ways are through like text and through graphics, and I'm wondering whether there are other um, less dominant and um, unconsidered, like overlooked ways of avatar representation, and whether they confine or empower the users. All right. Yes. Yeah, so. You're talking about are there different ways that we can represent our, our, ourselves other than text-based systems and graphical systems? 
So, you know, first, one of you know, one thing I guess I want to you know, just say to bracket you know, all of this this kind of work, you can say because the issue of identity representation is very broad because our identity is manifested in a number of different ways through our uh, I mean, normative categories, race, gender, ethnicity, you know, but also through our body language, through the discourse that we use, through our fashion. You know, so, so through many different kinds of vectors, we're representing our identities. And then also these kind of systems are very disparate. So I showed you Instagram profiles. I showed you avatars, you know, you know, you know, you know, character representations within you know, VR. So there's also a lot of different representations there. And an avatar can look like anything, really, at least graphically. So there's, there are a number of variables that exist there. So you can say, how can you make research progress in such a wide open domain? So one of the ways that we did this was then to say, what are the kind of core common commonalities in each of these kind of systems? One is that a number of the systems actually have implemented some form of categorization within them. So unlike in the physical world in which categorization happens through nuanced and contingent social interactions a lot of the time, you know, in these systems, it's actually hard coded. You can read off what the categorization systems are. And in fact, we can find that most of them are kind of top down taxonomic, what, is, what are uh, they called kind of classical cl classification systems. In contrast to what cognitive scientists suggest are prototype based systems, which you have radiant membership in categories, naturalizing categories over time, are marginalized through being in multiple categories and then have over, or through being in overlapping categories. So that's one kind of observation. We can say, what if we take one of these kind of systems more grounded in COGSI and, uh, and what we know from kind of identity critical research in social sciences and replace that classical top-down taxonomic system with this kind of, uh, with this kind of infrastructure. Basically, that infrastructure is, I guess, the Maserati that Chris was talking about, at least in, in one case. I mean, that's the one where, before I published a paper, the MIT Technology Licensing Office knocked on my door and said, you should file a patent on this before you, 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 you publish. And we did. That's why I'm spinning off of the technology now. Uh, and so that's one kind of, so you, know, you, you can you know, say that's one way to break down this area. The other way that relates to your question is that there are, despite these different forms of representation, there are shared computational components. So a lot of them have flat text profiles. That is, you have fields if you're using a social media account or a MUD uh, uh, or a computer game. You have numerical stats. You have graphical, flat graphical files. A lot of times you have 3D models and skins, not exclusively, but sometimes you have behavioral models that respond to behavior over time. So I give examples. You play a game for a while, then it gives suggestions of, say, what profession you might like. You use Facebook for a while, indicate your likes, it gives you suggestions for purchases and so forth. So there are actually overlaps between all of these and make them commensurate. So you, know, you should think that there's a wide range of possible representations that mix and match these kind of application, you know, you know, these kind of underlying components to begin with. And those underlying components also make it more amenable to uniform area of study. So the fact that you have these underlying shared components, as well as you have this kind of categorizations built into the systems makes this kind of uh, area that you can begin to get purchased into, you know, say, uh, in research. And then you know, I guess finally you asked me just to speculate about what other forms might be. I give my students suggestion, uh, assignments sometimes create new forms of user representation. Some students have constructed works that look like social networks, but you, act, you have a, a kind of graphical model, like InfoViz model that shows your network. So you can see the topology of that network. So you have a gra graphical representation of you that's like a topology of your network. That's a kind of avatar there, but also represents your, your network with, uh, within, within the space. That's just, uh, uh, that, that's just one. You can have systems that are co-controlled by you and the machine that is, I refer to as kind of agency play. That is, you're controlling it at some times. You set in a kind of trend. You're playing a game aggressively, you know, you know, for example, or you're using interactive narrative system and you're cautious as you explore the space. And then based upon that pattern, the system goes on autonomously and then generates new content in the vein that you've already been exploring. So that's another type of system I think is a kind of exciting type of system that's not just an agent that you control, but one that is partly autonomous and partly user controlled. And that autonomous control can have kind of thematic impact on your, you know, your system or identify trends in what you've already been doing and then behave on its own sometimes. So there, anyway, there's two speculative types. So not just we built some like this, you know, but, you know, but also speculating further afield. Hi, Fox. Uh, thanks for the fascinating ride. I have a question about uh, grayscale, and uh, maybe I was misunderstanding something, but it appeared as if all the responses that the user gives 
are classified into this matrix of hostile sexism, ambivalent sexism in various forms. This seemed like there was no way to not respond sexist. And my hope is that that's not the case. Uh, it's a personal hope and also a societal hope. So I know that you're interested in educational tools and in transformative reflection. So how does Grayscale, uh, or does Grayscale give feedback that not only sort of diagnoses where you are in the sexism range, but what might be productive responses that may lower conflict, that may not reinforce some people's inappropriate comments? Right, it's a great, it's a great question. And so I should begin by, so the question is, does Grayscale only give you options that are sexist or does it also give you non-sexist kind of options? And then outside of that particular kind of question, how might you leverage this kind of system to, I, th I think it's to engender some kind of change within this domain. Uh, and so first you can choose non-sexist options within it. It's not just categorized you know, as, uh, as these. So I just didn't include a, a column in the chart that says non-sexist. I guess that's a kind of default, you know, like a marked category that exists there. But I think outside of that, it's not, but it's also not a game that, uh, so some, for some people, the definition of a game means you have a disequilibrium outcome, that is you have a winner and loser within the system. But the aim here is not if you act as a non-sexist within this, then you win, because in the physical world, sometimes you can act in a non-sexist way and face repercussions, right, obviously. And, and so we actually want to engender reflective thought about these kind of phenomena too. So in some of the kind of themes as you navigate this, you can act entirely in a non-sexist way. I think one of the ones that, uh, that I showed, I didn't say the way you're classified there, but you're acting in a non-sexist way, but you're under watch and scrutiny because you're not conforming to the kind of cultural norms of the company. And so it's actually a kind of thematic, uh, uh, kind of thematic phenomena like this that we want to encourage effective engagement on. And so the model that we're using becomes a vehicle then to think about some of these kind of tensions, ambiguities, and, uh, you know, and, and trade offs. I mean, ambiguities in the sense not did something sexist actually occur or not, but ambiguities in the sense that there are trade offs in terms of how you respond within these, within these kind of realms. And then, in terms of your second question, so we've done assessments in terms of engagement within the system and assessments in terms of did it engender reflection. And one of the interesting kind of uh, results with this is that you know, for a number of users, you know, it did in, uh, engender reflection, but it wasn't equal across demographic boundaries. That is, female users of the system ended up reflecting more than male users of the system which is interesting because you could presume that female users of the system have encountered these kind of events you know, you know, you know, directly. And so one of the kind of issues that we began asking then is what kind of, should we do some kind of assessments beforehand? What kind of assessments for implicit bias or prior beliefs? And so a lot of reflective engagement work is about you know, how your presuppositions you know, you know, respond to the kind of belief systems you have you know, out there in the world as you encounter knowledge, you know, new knowledge. And so, one of the things, we're just in the process of developing assessments. First, what can we do to engage kind of prior knowledge and disposition in these kind of areas? And then also, can you customize the experience of the system based on issues like demographics, prior belief and presupposition, and so forth? And how would you have to change the system in order to respond to this kind of different starting conditions for users? So I mean, these are broad and wide open questions. I mean, I welcome also, I mean, social scientists like, you know, like yourself and others to help us think this through, but we're in the process of, again, developing these types of assessments uh, further those types of customizations of the system to target particular kind of demographics and also to scale it up so it doesn't just happen to individual scale but to platforms like edX to think what is it like to engage in a more kind of uh, you know, you know, a kind of uh, immersive naturalistic experience like this to reflect on these issues at broad scale contrasting to the kind of training tools that we have now so we're also exploring a grant to do that kind of a scale up to a large population one absolute last question, and that'll be you. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you think that grayscale, like things like grayscale, could be used to um, find optimal ways to respond to sexism or things like that in the workplace. Right. So it's it's a good question. So can works like grayscale or even the Mises about microaggressions, could they help people to rehearse the ways that they're going to? Know, perform when they encounter it. And so 
certainly you could use a system you know, you know, in, you know, to explore the kind of impacts of different responses. I mean, that's what we do with the work on microaggressions. The microaggression work actually is a bit bleaker, like the you know, like a question that I just got you know, previously, because one of the tensions with microaggressions is that they're dismissed as minimally harmful, as I mentioned, and then also that when microaggressions uh, occur, people have doubt about whether a discriminatory experience just happened because if you encountered some number of them, you're socialized to expect that you'll have another one in the future, and so you don't know if it actually really occurred. So in that case, you can rehearse the kind of response to it, you know, but it's not only a matter of how you respond, but it also might be the case that thinking about issues related to cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy, kind of what's your response, how do you internalize kind of microaggressions and so forth, is another, uh, is another lens to look at the, you know, you know, through which we can look at the system. Because when you think about something like an optimal response, actually if you have this kind of idea that you can respond perfectly in a kind of discriminatory situation, then you, know, you, you feel like you could win if only you do the right thing. I mean, that relates to a lot of kind of the work in distorted, uh, in, in distorted thought patterns and, and, and so forth. At the same time, I think in terms of sensitivity, unconscious bias, you know, implicit bias, and, the, and these sort of things, there is a realm for reflective thought and a kind of space to explore. And I mean, that's one of the benefits of interactive narratives, games, and this kind of area. You have a kind of space that's separate from your physical space in which the stakes might be lower, you can do work, I mean, to use learning sciences term, in your zone of proximal development, you know, challenge you just to write amount to learn, right, so forth, calibrate that from the individual user and have experiences that, for us, we hope you can then take and map out there into the physical uh, world. So that's a kind of idealized vision of what we can do, but certainly uh, I, I would say that what you're suggesting that you can rehearse within these spaces is something we're interested in, but I think that's only one part of a kind of broader array of type of interactions that you have in this space related to reflective engagement and conceptual change and even social change in our physical world. Thank you. Okay, so thank you.